positive 
because you would be ruining somebody's life if these accusations were not true. But Megan assures both of her parents that this is true. So they take her to the police to talk. Sergeant Robert McDaniel, who worked in the Special Victims Unit, was assigned to Megan's case. Megan seemed really scared to talk to police about what had been going on, but they reassured her that they had heard everything and they were only there to help her. So she begins to tell a story. She basically describes being groomed by Hickey for years. He would pay special attention to her and he made her feel very important and special. Just before her 15th birthday, he kissed her and soon after that 15th birthday, their relationship turned sexual. At this time, Hickey was in his 30s. The age that Megan was was very important in this case. In Virginia, sex between an adult and a child 14 years and younger is a felony. But sexual contact with a 15-year-old is only a misdemeanor, which means Hickey could maybe receive 12 months in jail. Megan's family is horrified to learn that it's not even like a huge crime what Hickey has done to their daughter. So they decide to kind of switch up the tactics and they go to the naval police. So Hickey was in the Navy and they come down much, much harder on adults who engage in sexual activity with minors in the Navy. So, Megan is then taken to NCIS where she gives her statement to naval officers. So they begin investigating Robert Hickey and if he was found guilty by the Navy, he could end up in prison for years. So next, the NCIS goes and questions Robert and he refuses to talk. He just flat out refuses to say anything. So they are kind of continuing their investigation without his help. Once Megan had admitted to the abuse she had been suffering, things turned around for her. She seemed to act as if, like, this huge weight had been lifted off her shoulders. Her grades began to come back up, and she was starting to act like her old self again. The future looked incredibly bright for Megan Landowski. Then, on April 10th, 2008, Megan's stepfather, Chris Short, came home from work to find a scene that is every parent's worst nightmare. Megan is laying in a pool of blood on the kitchen floor. She had been stabbed several times. There was blood everywhere. He immediately calls 911 to report that his daughter has been stabbed and he says, hurry, she's bleeding to death. Police Sergeant Robert McDaniel was about one block from the crime scene when the APB went out to law enforcement saying there had been a murder. He was the first officer on the scene and he goes in the home to clear it and there's no one in the home but the victim. As he looks down at the 16-year-old victim, he realizes he knows her. He knows he's staring at the body of Megan Landowski. While he doesn't know her family personally, he had been the one who was over her sexual abuse case, so he had met with her and talked with her weeks earlier. Now, here she is, laying in her kitchen, dead. By the time police officers arrived, Megan's stepdad was in this complete 
state of shock. He still has the phone in his hand, but he has this like glazed over look. And after a few minutes, he's kind of able to bring himself out of the shock long enough to call his wife, who rushes home. And as she arrives at her home, she tries to run into the house. And an officer grabs her and says, hey, you can't go in there. And she's like, no, I, this is my house. That's my daughter. I have to go in there. I need to make sure it's actually her. Angela's husband, Chris, like sees her arrive and runs up to her and says two words that would forever change Angela's life. He says, it's her. Chris did not want his wife to enter the home and see the horrible things that he had just seen. So Angela and Chris stood outside while their home was being processed. A small leaf was found on the bedroom floor and this leaf was significant because it matched a bush that was just outside of the master bedroom of the home. And this window was unlocked and opened, so investigators were pretty sure that was how the killer had gained entrance to the home. Megan had been sexually assaulted. Her skirt and underwear that she was wearing had been removed and were like flung around in her bedroom. The condition of her bedroom indicated that she had put up a fight there had been a really strong altercation going on. At some point during this fight, investigators believe Megan got away and ran downstairs into the kitchen because this is where Megan's body was found. She had been stabbed 40 times with a knife that the killer had taken right out of the butcher block on the counter of her kitchen. An autopsy on Megan would show that seven of these stab wounds had been inflicted after the girl was already dead. But the sheer volume of these stab wounds made police believe this attack was personal. The killer likely knew Megan and had a lot of anger to take out. On the girl. Also found at the crime scene were some bloody shoe prints that were found on the floor right next to the kitchen sink. It was later determined that these shoe prints were from a pair of Air Force Ones by Nike. Police followed these prints and they led from the kitchen right out the front blood on the inside doorknob of the home as well, so police know the killer just walked right out the front door after killing Megan. After an analysis of the blood in the home, they realized they had DNA from two people. One of the samples was Megan's and the other was their killer's. Often in brutal stabbing attacks like this, the killers get cut themselves, and this was good news because they had DNA from their killer. There was also a knife missing from the family's butcher block, so investigators know that the killer took the murder weapon with him. According to crime scene investigators, Megan's attack was very unsophisticated. The killer had tried to clean up quickly and evidence seemed to point to the fact that he had tried to wash Megan's blood off of his hands at the kitchen sink before leaving. So police immediately began working Megan's case. But it wasn't long before news of the murder began to spread and the community was 
say about her. She was super popular and they really couldn't find one person who had a grudge or anything against Megan. Appointments 
several of the kids on this bus and come up empty-handed. But this bus driver has some new information for investigators. This bus driver tells investigators that a boy named Robert Barnes had seemed just infatuated with Megan and she didn't seem to return these feelings at all. And this is the first time police hear the name Robert Barnes. He had not come up in any of their previous investigations. They talked to Megan's parents about him and they learned that he lived near them and he would go to Megan's house and then the two of them would catch the bus to school together. They were both really into their craft, Megan into her ballet, and Robert was a violin player and he was very good in his craft. He was a good student, he was an honor student, he'd never been in any kind of trouble. So please go and talk to Robert. He said all the right things to investigators, but they said they just felt like he wasn't being completely truthful. He seemed to be hiding something from them. He, they ask him if he will submit to a DNA test, and he's like, you know, I, I don't know. Let me talk to my mom about it, and I will get back to you. And the next day, he calls detectives and tells them that he has some information. So detectives go to the school and they talk to Robert again and he tells them that Megan had been really scared of someone. But this wasn't new information to detectives. They knew that Megan had been terrified of Hickey. So then they're like, okay, well, what about that DNA test? Did you talk to your mom? Do you think, you know, you could submit to that? And he's like, well, I didn't talk to my mom, but I'm sure it's fine. Now he was chewing bubblegum, and he's like, can you, like, take my gum as a sample? And they said yes, so he, like, spits his gum out into a wrapper and then puts it in a glove that the officer had, and they send the DNA off to the lab. Weeks later, the lab technician calls the detective with some interesting news. The DNA results had come back on Barnes, but the DNA had come from a female, so it couldn't have been Robert Barnes' DNA. When the DNA was collected, it's possible that Robert switched out the gum with someone else's gum. So they get his mother's permission and they pick him up from school and they take him to the police station where his mother is waiting and they begin to talk to him. As soon as they tell him that the DNA he submitted was female, he begins talking and telling investigators what had happened the day that Megan died. And his mom stops the interview. She says she needs to talk to her son outside and they leave because at this point he's not under arrest. And they go sit in her car and they talk for a little while. And then they both come in and he continues telling police what happened. According to him, Megan had invited him over. But when he got to her house, she wasn't answering the door and he was like knocking for a couple minutes. And so he decided to 
Megan, and according to him, after he had sex with Megan, the man told them both to go downstairs, and at that point, he grabbed a knife and began stabbing Megan repeatedly. Robert said after Megan was dead, the man made him hold out his hand, and he cupped his finger with the knife, and that his blood began to drop down and mix with Megan's blood, and then the man told him to leave, to take the knife and drop it in the sewer and run, and if he ever told anyone about this, he would come and kill him. So, surprisingly, <laughs> police do not believe this story at all. So they arrest Robert. News of his arrest kind of shocked the community. He was the nicest kid. He had no criminal record. He never even got in trouble at school or at home. He was an honor student. He was a very talented and accomplished violin player. And the community kind of split. It really became a race issue where a white girl had been killed and they had arrested a black man. And so there was a lot of tension in the community about this. Police searched Robert's computer and they found even more damning evidence in the case. So apparently he was very into rape and murder. He had photoshopped a picture of himself into a newspaper article about an elderly woman who had been raped in her home. In a chat room, Robert had even asked, if someone told you they had just killed someone, what would you say to them? Within 24 hours of his arrest, police had a positive match on his DNA, and they had finally caught their killer. Given all of the physical evidence tying Robert to the crime, his lawyer wanted a plea deal, and the prosecutor agreed. Megan's family was really glad that there wouldn't be a trial. They didn't want to have to live through a trial. Her mom told Dateline she didn't want the graphic details about what had happened to her daughter shared to the world. Robert Barnes pleaded guilty to first-degree murder, attempted rape, aggravated sexual battery and statutory burglary. He will be eligible for release after 42 years. It seems his motive in killing Megan was that she had rejected him. She had not been interested in him romantically and police believe that he had planned this crime for months before committing it. So that is the murder of Megan Landowski. This story is so crazy because if it had happened like 20 or 30 years ago, you know Robert Hickey would be sitting in jail right now for a murder he did not commit. If they did not have DNA testing, I just feel like they would have arrested him and he would be in jail right now. Anyways, let me know what you guys think. I will see you next time.